What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Hockey Town University. You're here with me, Zach. I'm also here with my two co-hosts, Leslie. Glad to have you back, buddy. And Derek, what's up, boys? Hey, hockey world. How you doing? That, that was it from Derek? All right. That was, uh, that's all I got right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I guess, guess I can't complain. It's been, it's been one hell of a week here in Michigan, you know, from my storm to... You know, my grandfather's funeral yesterday, and then I wake up today, and I have a fucking flat tire on my car. Ooh. So, it's been a good week. It's been fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to just go to bed tonight and wake up, and hopefully everything's better, because Jesus Christ, I couldn't, I couldn't be going more through it if I tried. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in one over here. Well, we're really glad to have you back, Leslie. Uh, it's been a long week, good for sure. Care. Um, like you said, you know, we had the crazy winter storm Cletus, uh, that thing was insane. It sounds like you guys definitely got the worst of it being in Michigan than I did. I just had rain all that one day and the next morning. It was just frosted over, which was really nice. But yeah, my weekend, you know, my dad stopped over today and, uh, we finally set up the, uh, pizza oven that he had got me for Christmas and, uh, made some pizzas out of that. That was a lot of fun. So can't complain on that. Um, Welcome back, though, everyone. Like I said, you know, it has been a week since we last recorded, so there's a lot to go over. Uh, but first, I just want to recap some of the games. Uh, on Tuesday, the Red Wings did win against the Washington Capitals 3-1. Uh, to one. We had a Robert Hag goal. Let's go, buddy. And then Pia Suter also had two goals. One happened to be a shorty. Uh, they were on the PK, and then he was able to find the puck and then dish it into the net, so... That's always great to see. And then he ended up, I believe it was just a regular five-on-five goal. If someone can uh, tell me that I'm wrong, please do. But that's what I remember. Uh, one important thing that did happen in that game was the Larkin uh, cross-check to TJ Oshie and his beautiful face. Larkin was assessed a five-minute major in a game misconduct. So not only did he have to serve a five-minute penalty, but he also ended up just getting kicked out of the game in general. I believe it was Jacob Vrana who served the overall penalty, but yeah, that came within the first 13 minutes of the game, so that was a huge loss for the Red Wings. Luckily, like I said, they were able to rebound and bounce back from that without their captain, their best player. Um, players like Pia Suter stepped up big time. He ended up playing the first uh, line duties for uh, Larkin to maintain that. Uh, Cop also had a really great game, Rasmussen as well. The overall team defense just looked phenomenal, and I think that's how they were able to get rewarded in that game. I just want to hear from you guys, from what you guys remember. I know that happened on Tuesday, so it's been some time, but what did you guys think of that overall performance with Larkin being out? Leslie? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the game was almost a, a week ago, so I'll do my best to remember that because, you know, most, most days that I wake up, I can't remember what I ate last night. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, the, to open up the scoring, we had offensive dynamo Robert Hag right there just ripping one home from, I think it was the blue line, so that's good to see. Oh. Um, he's invisible most nights, but I guess he just decided to turn on at that point. And then we had our elite, elite, some are saying top centerman, Hugh Suter. He chipped in two goals, so I believe at that point, I don't know what his stats are now, but at that point he had about five goals in five games, so... He's definitely yeah. been on a tear. He's been, honestly, one of the best depth forwards, not just on our team, but in the league. I mean, he's he's really just been blowing us away this whole time. And, yeah, I think it was a good, complete game from the boys. Obviously, Washington without Ovechkin. Nevertheless, it was good to get a win, because that, that was definitely a must-win game for the, the Red Wings, looking at their playoff picture. That's, that's a team they need to step over to get into the wild card. So as of right now, while we're recording this, they are about still two points out of a wild card. They are right behind Buffalo. And I believe it's Pittsburgh in the first wild card, but I could be wrong about that. But yeah, they, they still control their own destiny if they win the games in front of them. So it's, it's going to be exciting to see what they can do from here. Yeah, for sure. What about you, Derek? I mean, honestly, it was a great game. I love watching them, how they played. I was a little upset seeing Larkin get taken out for that hit right now. It's just not the greatest thing in the world to see. It wasn't a massive cross-check. Like, obviously, after watching the Tampa Bay game, we see another one of the same cross-checks, but nothing actually gets called. It's just basically cross-checking. So, 
sucks to see him get kicked out with that. But at the same time, it's whatever. Only that game itself was it, so we're good to go there. He's back in the next game after that. But, you know, we did great without him. It showed that the Red Wings don't just need Larkin to depend on, so that's really nice to see out there. Like, Suter did great, got two goals in there. We had Hag for goals, score his first goal at the Red Wings after, what, a year and a half drought of nothing? Like, I <laughs> love it. I'll take all the, the people on the back end who had to, like, finally pick up for the good person being gone to actually show that we actually are a good team. Like, we don't just need Larkin. We have somebody else out there that can do exactly what we need to see. It's funny, it's funny that you said that, Leslie, a must-win game, because it seems like pretty much every game that they have to play right now is a must-win game. And I say yeah, that, pretty much is, you know, right. yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's just insane, like, their schedule in general, and, you know, it really does make you wonder how how much longer that they actually can keep this up. Like, how Derek said, like, it was nice to see that they were able to do this with Larkin. Could they continue doing that with Larkin? Probably not. I mean, you were going up against a Caps team who was getting players back that were injured. So they were getting TJ Oshie back. They were getting Tom Wilson back. They were getting, uh, I believe it was Backstrom back as well. So they had a lot of injured players coming back that aren't truly up to speed. Um, And so we took advantage of that. OV was out as well. So yeah, you got to take advantage of that as best as possible. And one thing that did help, I think as well, was the fact that Anthony Mantha got injured during the game as well. So that kind of um negated the fact that Larkin got kicked out uh for probably one of the weaker cross checks to the face that I've seen and you know to Larkin's point like you probably saw if you went back and looked at the clip you know it was, it did seem like it was an accidental it did seem like that he truly did not mean to do it and the game is just so fast paced that it's hard to control things like that right but like Derek said you know it's crazy how the same thing happens in the Calgary game there's no penalty to Larkin Larkin does it, he gets a game misconduct, and then eventually, you know, he only did receive a $5,000 fine the next day, which is great. You know, that's probably all it should have been. You know, a lot of people's people's reactions were, it's at least a game, it's at least two games, you know, Larkin has a fence, blah, 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 and it's like, no, like, his penalty came from not playing the rest of the game. Like, I would have been shocked if he would have been suspended more than that. Um, But going into Thursday's game, the same exact thing happens to Rasmussen in the win over the New York Rangers, 4-1. to one. Kopp, Zadina, Rasmussen, Hironik all score a goal. Kopp, by far, probably his best performance of the season. He ended up with three points. Perron also ended up with two points. Um, well, one thing I want to say before I go any further into this, on the Capitals game, Zadina was a healthy scratch so that Verona could finally get in and play. I thought that was a little questionable because then going into the New York Rangers game, Jonathan Bergeron was scratched to maintain that Zadina and Verona could both play. That equated to a win as well. So, you know, is this pretty much just the Verona showcase that we're witnessing to let these younger guys sit to allow Verona to finally touch on some ice to show that he still can play in the NHL? What do you guys think about that, Leslie? Yeah, I, I think it's possible. I mean, you're looking at a whole bunch of guys on this team. There, there's really only a few that you would say at this at this moment you wouldn't want to trade. Um, I do know they've invested a lot in Verona. I think he's at just about a $5 million cap hit right now. So I think it's really more of a just making sure that he was absolutely ready for NHL ice and just getting him out there and seeing what he can do. And he looked pretty good. I mean, he had four shot attempts. He really didn't look out of place on the ice out there. Of course, he didn't score a goal on anything, but he was plus one if that really matters to anyone. I know it doesn't to us, but yeah, he, he looked he looked fine. Obviously, he's still got a long way to go. You can't just miss all that time in the NHL and just step right in and continue your, your scoring. It's just not going to happen, but it was good to see him. I wasn't crazy that the price of seeing him was having Zadina scratched, but you know, when you're a good team, you kind of have to pick and choose who you're going to scratch, and it is what it is. It's a good problem to have. It's a problem we really haven't been able to have for the past five or six years, so I suppose that's the silver lining to it, but yeah, it was it was good to see him out there. I, I was really happy he could get a game in before the uh, 
got sent back down to GR. Yeah, and he only got sent down technically for a day, not even. It was just a paper transaction thing to save the Red Wings' uh, time on the uh, whole... Uh, I don't even know how you want to call it. Like the, You can only have someone up for so long before they have to be sent back down or something. So it's just a weird thing on how the league works. And um, But yeah, I, and it's just weird because even going further, and I know I keep on going off on what I w- want to talk about on my top t- topics, but Verona was then healthy scratch for Saturday's game. Now, I don't know if that's because they want him to watch the game from above and just kind of see like what's going on, but that might have been a bad example considering that Vasilevsky just came in and shut him out with 45 shots on that. They didn't get a single goal. Um, but I digress, and I want to backtrack to the cross-check situation. Like I said, you know, Michael Rasmussen was cross-checked in Thursday's game against Lindgren. Only got a two-minute penalty. So... It was definitely a worse cross-check than what Larkin did to TJ Oshie. The fact that the refs even took the time to go over it with Toronto and see what the deal was and what the punishment should have been, I think it's... We know that this has been an ongoing issue, that the refing is very consistent at being inconsistent. They definitely make their choices more so on... To me personally, biased feelings, not saying that they're against the Red Wings, but I don't think that the rules are as clear as the refs make it sound that it is, or the league does. And it's very much on situational context, if you will. And the refs don't really seem to understand that... At this point, I don't even care. If you get cross-checked in the face, it should be the same thing for every single player. I don't care who it is, what team, how it happens. If you get cross-checked in the face, if that's the president that you're setting for Larkin, do it for all these other players. You know, it, 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 at this point, it does seem like that the league is a little out to get the Red Wings, but that's not really what I'm trying to say here because I don't want that to be the president that I set, you know, talking to all you guys, you know. Um, but it is just really bad how consistent that they are at being inconsistent. It's an ongoing struggle, and it's probably something that's never going to go away. And this is the league that talks about how they want to get rid of the dangerous hits, how they want to make it more of a safe league. But the way that they go about their punishments is all wrong. You know, it's always different, and they don't seem to be very good at being consistent. I keep on saying that because that's what it is. They're very good at being consistently inconsistent. Three times, I gotta say it. So. Yeah, but I mean, you keep repeating it because it's absolutely right, you know? I mean, really, the only thing that's consistent with these kinds of things is it seems like the Red Wings are always on, you know, the the bad end of it. Like, I, I don't really get it. It's just, I guess you have different crews roughing games, so... Those kinds of things shouldn't be up to interpretation, but I think there's just some crews who will look at it in the moment and say, this is a five-minute major versus, oh, this will just be a power play. I, I, I really don't get how they do it. I, it really should just go through the rule book, but of, of course, that that's just not how it is. Um, yeah, I, I was actually, I have a theory about that. Maybe it's just Larkin got more time because he cross-checked TJ Oshie, who's, who's a noted very handsome man. And Michael Rasmussen, as much as I love him, he's not exactly a looker. So that one's just, you know, that's just a regular power of life. Don't even worry about it. It actually probably was an improvement. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. There's really something that's got to change. And like you said, they're, they're always trying to crack down on these violent hits to clean up the game a little bit. They're really not going to be able to do that until they finally get, like, a punishment sorted out for this sort of thing. Because if it keeps going like this, then there's, there's just no hope of it changing. Yeah, no, for for sure. And uh, Derek, welcome back. I know that you had some technical difficulties there, so you might be a little lost for those of you that aren't uh, paying attention to the video. The yeah, okay. so we talked about how it, how consistent the refs are being at being inconsistent. You know, you get cross checked in the Calgary game, no call. You get you cross check in the Caps game, you get kicked out, and you get a five minute 
penalty on you. Then you go into Rangers, and you only get a two-minute pa- pen- penalty power play. Yes, if I could talk. Um, you know, against the Rangers, for the same thing that Larkin literally did to Oshie two days before. I, what What's your take on that? You know, is it is the situation different? Or is it just all the same? If you cross-check someone in the face, that set the standard that it's a game and five-minute power, power uh, penalty. I mean, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have a same standard, no matter what the player is. I don't care if it's TJ Oshi, McDavid, Larkin out there getting smacked in the face, even though it was Larkin on Oshi for this instance. Just have consistency. I've been watching all these games. The only thing, I'm going to be the devil's advocate for the people out there. The refs are pissing me off. I usually just don't give a hell about what the refs are doing out there. Like, okay, fine, do your job. You're up here in the pros. Do something. That's fine. If you're going to do it consistently, make it consistent. Don't make it against one team worse than another team. Like, that doesn't make any sense. You're going to make everyone look at you badly. And we're all going to get pissed off. Like, we are. Like, even down to freaking icing calls, which I was already complaining to you guys about earlier, trying to watch the last two games here today. Like, what is going on with those? Literally, one bounced off the board, went to the goalie, and he was literally trying to play the puck, and they blew the whistle. Well, our guy on the Red Wings was literally going to beat the other defenseman to it anyways. I'm like, what What are you doing? You're getting actually paid a lot more than I get paid at my job to do a refing game right now in the NHL. Like, <laughs> Do it, do it right. Like it's not that hard. Like, it hurts my soul to see it. Cause I'm the last one wants to complain about breath. Cause that's just a weak way out. At the same time, no, stop. I hate breath. Yeah, I, I'm out there for sure. I still hate them. No, yeah, and I think when you say that, Derek, I think you speak for. I would like to say majority of the Wings fans that we definitely, it seems like it's definitely been a year after year after year thing. I mean, just the inconsistency of it all. I mean, it's not just us, it's other teams too. You know, I got friends that are loyal to other fan bases that say the exact same thing, you know, like they're just really good at being inconsistent and it's always based on situational context of what's going on. But it also seems like it's a, how did I say that Leslie earlier? It's uh it's a uh, feeling biased or um, just your overall emotional bias of what you feel like is a call and what isn't. And that's a problem with the refs, not the league. That's a problem with the refs that the league needs to set that standard for those guys. Moving on, before I lose my mind, the Red Wings did play against the Vasilevsky Lightning on Saturday and lost 3-0 to zero, uh, with a 45-save shutout against the Detroit Red Wings. And, yes, Vasilevsky is just an all-Tampa Bay player. You know, he carried that whole entire team. If he was not their goalie, I think the Red Wings had a really good chance because they, it's not that the Red Wings did not have quality opportunities. They had plenty of them. Did the Red Wings finish on them? No. Should they have? Yeah. If it wasn't Vasilevsky... It probably would have been a five to three game, to be honest with you. And Huso was only scored on twice, so there was one empty net goal. The first goal on Huso, Braden Point. My God, that guy is a wizard. I, I would love to have him. And I'd love to have one of those. And as sure. soon and as soon as he scored, I had this one guy message me on Twitter saying, "This is why teams would rather have Braden Point than Larkin, and you don't pay Larkin more than nine mil." A season i was like okay dude like what why do i keep on getting the crazy people on twitter trying to contact me saying that larkin isn't worth what he's expecting to get and it's like i don't know what to tell you man i just want him to be on our team forever that's all i want i don't care how much it is at this point just leave me alone <laughs> larkin we're not realistic over here all the time <laughs> you just kind of throw out what we want to happen yes that's it i'm not so, perfect like all praise Larkin, like, I'm not doing that, but I am, like, all hail Larkin, because he is the best player in the team, but, yeah, I, 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 crazies, stay away from me on Twitter, and I'm not putting out my Twitter handle on there, because I know you guys are crazy, not doing that, uh, but, yeah, going on in that game, Rana, back to him, was a healthy scratch this game, now, was he supposed to just watch the game from the Raptors and see how the wings did, like I said, 
probably that's probably part of it but you also got to give him a little rest because he's only played four games in the season so far you know and i don't know if this was necessarily one of the best games to make him watch from the standings other than this is why we need you out on the ice is to bury the puck into the net because after watching that game i think that that's where I stand right now is that this team really, really, really just needs that pure goal scoring uh, finisher at this point. Whether that's Verona, a pastor knock, whoever you have to go out in free agency to get, be a trade, I don't care. But that is one thing that the Red Wings do not have. Um, and I'll kind of go into that further down the line because I do have some questions uh, that I do want to ask you guys. But I want to go back to the Rasmussen topic as well. Going to Rasmussen, not only did he get a cross check in the neck on Thursday, but he also took a he took a really really hard clap bomb. I can't remember who it was from, but he took it right to his right to his kneecap, and I just cringed instantly. I was like, "There goes his kneecap! Like it's definitely got to be shattered at that point. It was dead on." Derek, Derek, you, Derek, you just watched the game, so give me give me your uh, exact reaction and uh, what you think about oh, that, buddy. You, man, you saw that thing go right to the inside of the kneecap on the left, <laughs> yeah. on the right side of his knee. Like, oh, God, right knee, left side, inside of his knee. Oh, probably going like 70 miles an hour. There's barely any pad there anyways. And if you're like me, you take more padding now because I didn't want any padding in my pads anyways. I didn't care. It's like, you just take the shot, but my God, you can't do anything about that. That's like one in a hundred shots. Prop. Well, depending on how fast it was and where it hit, he could have like shattered something even. I hope not. He got off the ice, but you know, he had to limp off into the dressing room afterwards as we yeah. watched that. Yeah. Like he didn't even make it in the dressing room all the way. They had to stop him. And then they had to go in there after like two other guys took him in there. It's like, that's never a good sign. Like you can't make anything good out of that. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, right. <laughs> what were your thoughts on that, Leslie? What do you, What do you think is going to end up with uh, Rasmussen? Since we truly don't have any news on it, other than Lebone suggesting that it's looking like a Tyler Bertuzzi situation. So, long term, foreseeable future at this point, technically, currently. But what What do you think overall? God, I mean, if he takes a, a shot off the knee and it's possible that his kneecap is shattered, there's no chance you see him back. I mean. You may not even see him back for training camp. That's a brutal injury, and I mean, depending on whether he needs surgery or not, he's out the whole summer, at least, what are we now, February? Yeah, like six or seven months. That, that's just, that's a tough injury for him, and it's really a big loss for the Wings because he's, he's just so good in that bottom six. I mean, he's, he's just, he's such a different player this year, and I, I really feel bad for the guy because this was the year he really seemed to be turning it around and just mm-hmm. kind of coming into form. I mean, he's just... He's been tremendous wherever he was in the lineup, playing you know in the top six of Larkin, playing at the bottom six. So yeah, that's that's a that's a loss that I don't think a lot of people realize how big it is. I really don't. And I and I hate to cut you off if, if you're not done, but I do want to mention that I, I want to make a correction to your statement. You said bottom six. It's crazy to think that he has been playing the second line for a uh, majority of the month. I'm pretty sure all month actually of February he's been on the second line. With Cobb and Perron. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's been in the middle six, not so much as the bottom six. But either way, yeah, that's right. still a huge loss to your roster because he leads the team in shot blocking. And he mm-hmm. plays PK. You know, I'm pretty sure he plays a little bit of power play. But yeah, that's a huge blow to your team. And he was having a really good season. So I hope that it's not long term. Um, but if it is for the rest of the season, you know, I wouldn't be shocked. Um, But that is a huge blow to the team, unfortunately. And, you know, I hate to see that happen, considering that we are making a really great push for the playoffs. Like you guys mentioned, you know, we're just a couple points out. Um, We're currently right behind Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has one point over us. Um, Buffalo has two points on us with the same games played, same as Pittsburgh, same games played. And then New York Islanders with 69 points. We have 64 but they have 63 games played, and we're standing above teams like Florida with the same amount of points, but we have three games on them, so this is such a tight race, and honestly, like, the East is not getting easier, and once again, I'll touch on that here shortly. Um, But how, I I just want to ask you guys, how badly do you think this Rasmussen uh, situation is going to affect their playoff chances? 
if Iserman does not do anything to the roster in between, let's just say that they stay pat, they don't make any changes other than Rasmussen getting injured. Do you think that this affects their chances of getting into the playoffs? You know, I, I would love to say yes. I really don't think it will. Um, I, I don't know who's going to slot in that spot for Rasmussen. I'm assuming it's going to be maybe a guy from the AHL, and when Raymond comes back, that, that'll that fill out the lineup. So, you know, it, it is a big loss, but in terms of pushing for the playoffs, I don't know if it's really going to make that big of an impact. But if we do actually get into a round, you may feel his absence a little bit because he's, he's the kind of player that you have in your middle six who – his game is, is really suited pretty well for the playoffs. I mean, he does yeah. all those little things with the penalty kill, and, you know, he's a great two-way player. He's a great net front, net front presence. So I, I, I suppose it's possible if we're sitting here a week from now and they are buyers that they could go get a, a good rental from the middle six if he's not going to come back. I, you know, it, I, I love him for our team, but there, there are some players out there that you can slot in for the time being if he's going to be out. But, yeah, he's, he's definitely become one of my – he's growing on me. You know, he's, he's becoming one of my favorite players. So, I am – I mean, shit. There's his bobblehead right here. He says, oh, no, why do I have to get injured? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a tough loss, but I, I think the, the team could still band together and push for the playoffs without him. For sure, for sure. What about you, Derek? you think the Red Wings can still make a push for the playoffs without Rasmussen, or do you think that this is a sign saying that maybe they should uh, consider maybe selling? They would definitely always keep in the back end the selling aspect, but at the same time, I do think the Red Wings can't, even without Rasmussen in there, like, pushing that knee, he's probably going to be out for a while. No one wants to see that or say that, but it's going to probably happen with what happened. I'm hoping for the opposite, but I do think the Red Wings can actually make it a little decent of a way. I don't know if we're going to win, you know. There's some teams out there that are making it pretty difficult for that to happen right now, but at the same time, I do believe we'll make a good push even without him in there. Like, on the, on the short run or the long run, you know, if you want to trade, it's a good option right now. Good selling time. See what we could get. Obviously, we talked a little bit about that earlier, and it was a pretty dramatic kind of thought process we were going for. But, you know, if we can get something good out of it, I can't say it would hurt. But at the same time, he's been doing very well for the team. What did he score? What, how many points he has? Like four points in the last three games? Minus the last one he was in. I mean, he's already eclipsed his point total, which was about five games ago he did that. So he's, he's doing great. Yeah, that's what I was hearing about, too. Doing pretty well. Like, why can't you, like, either get something good from him or just, you know, keep on the back end? But I want to ask you guys, like, who do you think we're going to bring up? Because you guys are more acquainted with, like, what we have in the AHL, the roster team, than what we can bring up that actually replace him besides me. Because, yeah, I don't know any of that shit. I mean, so I really like to do that. If I'm being completely honest, I we're so close to the trade deadline that. It's funny, like, we, we could even be a little mix of, like, sellers and buyers where we could ship off Bertuzzi because it's probably the best thing for the future of the team to do that and get whatever you can. And we could also go out and shop for a middle six player that could fill Rasmussen's spot. And I think I'd rather have that just from some guy in the AHL who's going to come up. And you don't ideally want to have, you know, those just, like, patchwork players from the AHL on your squad when you're trying to push for the playoffs. You want to try and get every NHL caliber player you have because it's it's a tough race from here and the wing schedule is only getting harder so I would I really like to see them add someone with experience not just NHL wise but playoffs in general myself personally with that question Derek is you know this this kind of it sucks to say it but this kind of comes in at a good time for Rasmussen to get injured because now that Lucas Raymond should be ready for tomorrow's game against the Ottawa Senators. Someone who hasn't played at all this week and has been injured for majority of February. You know, this opens a spot back up for him. And you still have Verana to scratch. I guess that's like your 13th forward. So I don't see them calling anyone up or making a trade right away to fill in that spot. Because like I said, you have Raymond coming back. Um... But I wouldn't be surprised as well if maybe they make Raymond sit a little more 
because that's it's only going to benefit him. There's no reason for us to bring him in quickly, especially. Um, and I think that's the reason why, because that was the, the expectation was that he was going to come back on Saturday and play against Tampa Bay. Well, they didn't. Is that because they want him to sit and rest up a little bit more? Partially, but I think it's also because it gives these other players the opportunity to show what they have in a bigger role in the off chance that if they were traded to a more highly touted playoff Stanley Cup contending team, then those teams can feel better knowing that if an injury were to happen, then I know that I could bring X player up a spot if need be. So right now, I don't think that the Red Wings aren't in the spot to trade for someone to fill a middle six or a top six position. But like Steve Eiserman mentioned on uh, what was that podcast with Alan Walsh, uh, agent provocateur. He mentioned that I would be willing to make a trade for someone that can fill it in our top six if they were going to stay with us long-term. So Iserman is still very much on that plan where he wants players anywhere from the 24 to 27 range, much like he's been saying for these last few years. So Iserman also mentioned that I typically don't like to trade young players and I don't like to trade first round picks, but I'm not against that. So I think that that's probably what Iserman would do, but I want to talk about that later on as well. But like I said, Derek, I probably wouldn't call anyone up right now only because we still have Raymond and Verona technically out. So those are the two players that would fill in that spot if you wanted to pick either one. And to be honest with you, like I said, I think I would have Raymond sit a little bit longer until after the deadline and give Verona a little bit more room and showcase these other players to kind of figure it out from there. And if this Rasmussen injury really does hinder um, – your opportunities to win these next three games. So Ottawa twice back to back. And then on Thursday, you have Seattle with the deadline on Friday being five days away from today. We are recording this Sunday night. Uh, it is 8 41 PM right now. No trades have happened. When we record on Wednesday, I want to ask you guys, do you think that there's going to be at least one trade done by the Red Wings? Whether if that's a buy or sell Derek, I want to hear from you first, buddy. Okay. I got nothing on it. I'm like, there's really nothing I think we're going to trade for right now. I think we're going to push it off and let her, like you said, we're going to showcase. We're going to show everybody what we got, especially with Ottawa back-to-back. Mm-hmm. have been doing the greatest this year. That's a real team that we can actually push against and actually like produce a lot of points and yeah. showcase what we got. Mm-hmm. Might as well do it and might as well take the hit for right now and see what we can do. Make everyone look at us a little bit better, you know. Get a couple more points in the long run too, you know. Beat Ottawa. I don't care about Ottawa at all. Let's beat them up. Yeah, I'm they... pretty sure we can destroy them two games in a row. No, and you're absolutely right. And I'm sorry to cut you off as well, but I do want to mention that they basically don't have. <laughs> they've been riding on a third string goalie now. They don't have their top two goalies. Uh, granted, one was good, the other one wasn't really as good. But yeah, they're basically riding on a third string goalie right now. So their season is. Yeah on the line as well as ours is technically. So they're not too far behind this either. Looking at it, they're only four points behind us. That's two games. If they beat us both times, they're tied with us. We dropped them. You're interested close to calling me up and having me be the backup. That's how bad their situation is. I'll do it. You know, just give me base salary. I'll fill in. So same same question to you, Leslie. I'm going to ask you the same thing. Again. Do you think that there's going to be at least one I'm trade? No, you're good. Do you think there's going to be at least one trade by the, between now and the next time that we record, whether that's a buy or a sell trade? Well, so the next time we'll be on will be – that should be Wednesday, so it'll be after yeah. those two Ottawa games. And it's like I told you guys offline, I think it was yesterday, I, I really have no idea what this team is going to do until the deadline day. I mean, it's just – it's really going game by game. If, if we're sitting here on Wednesday – both of those Ottawa games are wins, then we, we could see them by. I honestly could see them by. Mm-hmm. And if we drop both both those games, it's it's we're going to be sellers. So I, I kind of still feel in my heart, no matter what, that Bertuzzi is we're going to have a deal done for Bertuzzi. And the only thing that's really keeping me from like being 100% certain that's going to happen is if there's just not a good enough return 
that outweighs having him as a rent, like pretty much our own rental right. for our playoff push. I mean, yeah. if we're if the only team at the deadline day that is interested anymore is Dallas, and all they're offering is you know pick whatever that would be twenty seven or twenty eight, and a, a mid tier prospect. If I'm Steve Eisman, I'm I'm not taking that. I'd rather have Bertuzzi and just try and make up my own push and see if you can sign him in the off season or just. If he does end up being a rental, hopefully you can get in. But I, I really kind of feel like we're, we're just not going to know until that day, and I really don't think any trades will go down for the Wings until that day. No, 100%. I mean, I the, the word has come out that Bertuzzi is technically off the trade block, and me personally, I don't really believe that. Like, I I, I take the word for it that he is off, but in the expectation that I haven't liked the offers that have come my way so far. So I'm just going to pull them off until a team really says, hey, man, I'm really desperate. I really want that Tyler Bertuzzi, almost like the Dave Chappelle crackhead, you know? So, yeah. and there's going to be a team that's like that. And I think now this is when I can start finally bringing these questions on to you guys. Um, do you... Guys, yes. Finish that thought process. You got this, Dad. I mean, what do you guys think it would take truly to move a Tyler Bertuzzi? I'll let Derek go with that one first. Did you get rid of him like that for the Red Wings to let him go is what you're saying. So I guess one thing I should mention to kind of help you guys understand, I guess, where I'm coming from with Tyler Bertuzzi is that after watching him this whole entire week, um, he, no goals. That's huge. There's no yeah, goals. That's not for lack of trying, though. No, and that's fine. But I will, I will mention that on Saturday after – watching him play in Tampa, there were definitely some questionable decisions that he made. Um, His ability to get the puck after a pass was made to him wasn't exactly there. There were a couple of times where he fumbled the passes a couple, like a few times. Um, Fumbled a couple goals there too. Yeah. You know, but he had a couple opportunities to score. So it's for me, You know, am I willing to risk to make Bertuzzi my own rental? It's like knowing that I don't even know where I'm truly going with this either, to be honest with you, because I think like at this date where I'm at now is that I've seen what Bertuzzi can and cannot do. And I think I'm finally at the point where I'm almost okay with getting whatever I can for him. Um, and I don't mean that as in, like, I just take a second round pick. I mean that as in, if you can give me a prospect that can, that has the ability to score, I might consider that, or a prospect that's similar to Bertuzzi, uh, the hard no style of play, I'd do that. Maybe throw in a second along with that. So a B-level prospect of a second, I might do that. I'm just nervous that... If we keep him, you know, what is that? What The message going to Larkin is that we're keeping him for the rental side or are we keeping him because we plan on keeping him long term? That's Larkin's boy. I mean, he's the, he's the other longest tenured Red Wing on this team other than maybe Philip Peronic. You know, those three truly are the lone star Red Wings from when we were really super bad in 2019-20. So uh, that that's kind of where I'm at with it personally. I think I would, yeah, I think I would just take almost anything. And I do think that there is a team that will come on, on trade deadline day and just be that nervous rack and just be like, just give it to me. Just give him to me. And the reason why I think that is because I'm looking at all of these players getting traded. And this is what I wanted to break down for you guys is all the trades that have happened so far. And for those of you listening, and to my co-hosts listening, I want you guys to make note of this, and I want to see if you guys recognize the trend that I'm 
bringing on to you guys when I say these trades. So since our last recording, we did mention how um, the Leafs acqu acquired Ryan O'Reilly. Um, the night that we did record, the New York Rangers acquired forward Tyler Mott from the Ottawa Senators in exchange for Julian Gauthier and a seventh round pick. Not really a lot. The Arizona Coyotes acquire defenseman Shea Weber on February 22nd and a fifth round pick in the 2023 NHL draft from the Vegas Golden Knights in exchange for, pardon me if I pronounce this wrong, Dyson, Dyson, Mayo. Dyson Mayo? Yeah. Okay. That 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 one blew my mind. I, that one just, we talked about that in our group chat, right? How it was. That was a wild one. Now, yeah. I don't know if that's because Vegas needed the LTIR spot or if Arizona needed the cap because you need to hit the floor. So same thing that we did with Pavel Datsuk to help them out and get them a higher draft pick. And then we got down Shalowski. We could have had Chicharin. It was, it was most likely the floor for Arizona, I bet, to help out with the chicken trade. Even I think, though that still hasn't gone down as of right now. I mean, I think it's, it's probably both. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Vegas obviously needs as much help as they can get because they've definitely put themselves in a weird predicament for years to come. They, they always blow my mind somehow on the same day, February 22nd, Chicago Blackhawks acquired Nikita Zaitsev and a second round pick in the 2023 NHL draft and a fourth round pick in the 26th NHL draft. Whoa. You never see trades like that where picks just like three years ahead of time. You don't know where like, the team's... They've been trading them off a lot this year, like, so far. I mean, I haven't heard anything on the past 26, but I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if we hear farther because they're just tossing those guys out there like three candy. You know? That's what the mm -hmm. NBA does. I mean, like, it's that's not exactly, a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. And that's the risk that you're willing to take, you know? Um, but along with that trade, uh, yeah, that was from the Ottawa Senators in exchange for future considerations. So Nothing. They get nothing. Feature considerations hey, literally mean nothing. Really, unless you, what Leslie said, here's a free stake. Yeah. Um, unless Gosh. you're like, you know, you're on the draft floor and uh, you're in the seventh round and there's a guy that one of your uh, scouts really, really, really likes, but you don't have any more seventh round picks. You call up that team and be like, can we have your seventh? Yeah. Fine. We owe you one. Sure. It's, it's just like, you know, the next time you're in town, I'll take you out to my favorite titty bar and buy a dance for you. That's, that's about <laughs> really all it is. <laughs> yeah okay okay <laughs> all right moving on on february 23rd the Anna analogy, I love it. <laughs> february 23rd the anaheim <laughs> ducks acquire forward josiah slavin from the chicago blackhawks in exchange for forward hunter drew no idea february 23rd blockbuster boston bruins now this is the big one this one was a good one. The Boston Bruins acquired defenseman Dmitry Orlov and forward Garnett Hathaway from the Washington Capitals in a three-team trade that also included the Minnesota Wild. Now, I think it was you, Leslie, who asked why the Minnesota Wild keep on retaining these salaries and getting these picks for it. Well, that's pretty much it. They're just taking on caps so that way they can just get more picks. Now, I don't know if that's for trade purposes to collect as many picks as you can and then just shell them off for another player. That very may well could happen, but not very well, often. They could, just be picks. they could be picks you just deal with the draft to trade up. That as well. You know, or trade down. Oh, that as well, you know, and there's... Yeah. It, it, it could go either way. Uh, but continue on with the trade. The Bruins also acquire forward prospect Andre. Zvetlakov from Wild and Capitals acquire forward Craig Smith, first round pick in 2023 NHL draft, a third round pick in the 2024 NHL draft, and then a second round pick in the 25 NHL draft, Derek. We're getting pretty wild, no pun intended. But yeah. Uh, and then the Wild nice. acquire yeah. a fifth round pick in the 2023, 20, 2023, holy shit, tweet, tweet. Uh, draft from the, yeah, you got this. from the Bruins. So for taking on 25% of the salary, the Wild, the Wild just got a fifth round pick. That falls along between the lines of, you know, the Red Wings did that in the past, and that's about what they got. They got fours. They got, I don't think they ever got a third, but it was like a fourth and a fifth, you know. 
whatever. It's a bad not a bad deal. Um, I kind of just want to get your guys' opinions on this. Um, what do you guys think about this trade? Because this is definitely one of the bigger trades that have happened other than Tarasenko, Ryan O'Reilly. So a first was given to the Washington Capitals. They gave up Dmitry Orlov. Is this a sign that Washington is not going to make the playoffs and they're just throwing in the ropes? Me personally, no. Um, to be honest with you, I did not peg Dmitry Orlov as someone who could get you a first. And I don't know if that's because they also threw in Garnett Hathaway. That's um, possibly why. But, but you also got Craig Smith, so I guess that makes sense. Boston wanted to upgrade from Craig Smith, and that's how you got Garnett Hathaway. Craig Smith isn't exactly the best. It's not only that. They had, they had to move him to make the cap space, too. Right, as well. Yes, that is... Correct as well. So, like I said, the Capitals got a first, a second, and a third for Dmitry Orlov and Garnett Hathaway, essentially. But they also ended up getting 75 total percent retained on the cap. So, they had to pay more because of that, I'm assuming. Now, I like I said, I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this whole entire trade. Do you think this really helps Boston? Me, personally? Yeah. <laughs> I think this really does help out their defense. Um, Garnett, I don't know too much about him, so I'm assuming that's probably just fourth line PK help. But what do you guys think overall? You like it? We don't have to go too in depth in it. Just let me know if you guys like it, honestly, because this is. Let's I like it. I mean, goddamn Bruins, man! They just they can't keep getting away with it, man. They can't keep getting away with it. I, I don't know too much about Hathaway's game. I guess he's just, you know, like a bottom six kind of grinder guy. But every time I've watched Washington Capitals and Dmitry Orlov, I just remember back to that 2018 Cup run. He's always been a pretty solid D-man. I mean, he's you know, he's nothing flashy. He's not going to go out there and, you know, dangle and dip and dive and score top shutter. I mean, it's just he's not going to do that. But he's, he's a very solid D-man. I would imagine – that he's going to slot somewhere either on the second or third pair in Boston. So, yeah, that, that's a solid ad for Boston. He's going to be real good in the playoffs for them. Um, yeah, I, I think that from the standpoint of Washington, it, it may not indicate that they're just not going to make the playoffs and have to sell off as much as possible. And the only reason I really say that is because of one man, Alexander oh. Ovechkin, the grade eight. Oh, wait, I, I just, hold on. I'm sorry, Leslie. The New Jersey uh, Devils have acquired forward Timo Meyer and defenseman Scott Harrington from the San Jose Sharks in exchange for forwards Fabian Zetterlin and Andreas Johnson, defenseman Shakir Mukhamadulin, and Nikita Okotuk. I'm so sorry, whoever you are. And a 23 first round pick and a conditional 2024 first round pick. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. Wow, that's a big trade. Holy that's why man. it took so long wow. to announce man, because, man. oh my god. I was expecting at least one first round, but they talked wow. about two for two years. Jesus Christ. So they get a 23 first and a 24 conditional first. I don't know what the conditions are on that, but that is one haul of a trade. I don't know too much about these. I remember this. Makamadulin guy being drafted. I remember the name, but yeah, he was like, it was one of those picks where they were like, this guy could have been taken in a second, but that's okay. You know, whatever. But I mean, four, what is that? Four prospects, five, one, two, three, four, and two picks, four prospects. In my understanding, these are all prospects and two first round picks. The conditions I'm pretty sure, well, I can't say I'm pretty sure, but I'm willing to bet you it's top 10 or top 12 protected. You know, in the case that New Jersey doesn't put up the same numbers as they are this year for next year. Safe bet, you know, because that's a question that we have about the Red Wings, right? Are, is their success this season going to reflect next season as well? Because we've seen that for teams before, right? Where you have that one good season and then you take two steps back and then all of a sudden you start trending back up. It happens, especially with the younger teams. So, I mean, but, wow, breaking news. This is great. This is what we live I mean, for. we were hoping for it. 
I was telling you guys, too, in the group chat, too, I mean, like, the trade deadline, yes, is on Friday, but, like, things really start to heat up, like, the, like, five days right before. It's usually that Sunday night before yeah. and that Monday is when all the bigger names start to go and then all the smaller deals. So, I... Uh, so now that this happened, I, I before I go on talking about all the other trades that we missed, I, I want to mention this to you guys, and I just exited it out of it, and I hate myself. Let me pull it back up. Oh, boy. I think I lost it. But, yeah, what a, re what a, what a deal. I, Leslie, I want you to see if Cap Friendly has that up yet. In the meantime... I am going to it. find where this thing went. And I'm I useless have... over here. I have no internet. I'm going off my phone right now. So oh, I tried to look dear. up Timo Meyer, and I spelled his name as Timo Meower. Close enough. So one thing that I want to mention that I wanted to bring up earlier that I said that I would wait for. Here's the trend that I'm starting to notice that I don't think you guys have really picked up on yet. When I, when I mention these names, I want to see if you guys notice the trend that I'm saying. Timo Meyer, Bo Horvat, Ryan O'Reilly, Vladimir Tarasenko, soon to be Patrick Kane, and Dmitry Orlov. What do all those players have in common right now? Yes. Leslie? <laughs> I think we're both technically right. What, what did, did you not hear me? No, I did not hear you. I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, they all play in the NHL. Okay, that's also oh, correct. Oh, wow. Fair enough. Now, yeah. you guys might not have recognized this just because I just said their names, but I w the one thing that should have stuck out to you guys is that they all got traded to East Coast teams. Yeah, yeah, they oh, did. The Do you know how many trades? Do you know how many trades the West Coast teams have made for top-end talent? Zero. Yeah. Absolutely zero. The East, the East is, is a fucking arms race. It is an insane. Race. And granted that all these teams that made these trades, these are the teams that are at the top in the East standings. But wait until Pittsburgh. Wait until... Who else is in there? Wait until Buffalo. New York. New York got Bo Horvat. Look at them. They're up there. Florida. The Capitals probably surely aren't done. The Suns probably might try and get a goaltender and help them out. Are not done. Yeah. So that's why I ask you guys those questions. Like, are the Red Wings really going to make the playoffs when the East is this stacked? And is it really worth it to make the playoffs if you're just going to get first round exit in the four games that you play? Is it really worth it? And I'll still stand by it that making the playoffs. While, yes, you are going to get knocked down in those four games, most likely if you're going up against the Boston Bruins, you might be able to get one game if you can catch them off an off night. I do think it's important to get those young players into the playoff atmosphere. And in terms of ownership, management, and business aspect, it's good for the organization as a whole. So it's a win-win technically. The only loss that you're getting out of it is that you can consider that your younger players are getting dummied out there, and it, it would suck to see them go through that. But I disagree. I think that it's very important, and Iserman touched on that on the uh, uh, podcast I said that he was on, the um, the agent provocateur with Alan Washington and Walt Wild. He mentioned that, that he finds it very important to get players into the playoffs and let them see that exposure and... You know, and that's a reason I think too that Eisenman got those players in the offseason that he did. Pop's always been in the playoffs. Perron won a cup. Sunquist won a cup. Granted, he got Fabry early on, but he won a cup. Huso's been in the playoffs and he looks good. Kubalik's been in the playoffs? No. No? He's been in Chicago the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> all right that's fair you, you got me there. maybe he was in europe i don't know yeah so you know what i mean so like this seems to be the trend that eiserman wants is that like he wants the room to be filled with these players that have been there to teach these young kids when you get there you know this is what you have to do and so 
that's why I think it's good to pu- really do push for that playoff. And if you don't make it, you could still say that, like, you worked your tail off. You did what you could. And, you know, and if Iserman doesn't make any moves and they don't make it, you still call that a success because we're still very much in the realm of looking at the positives outside of not making the playoffs. So, like, the player development, the coach development, the scheme development, you know, is everything coming together? And it is. It, it's looking really great. And I said this in the tweet. I am on the Red Wings hype train right now, and I am riding it hard right now. Like, I am hammering the dub on every single bet that I make for the Red Wings, even as foolish as that sounds. That's how hyped I am right now, and that's how much I believe them. You know, what do you guys think with every with all those names that I said? Do you guys really do think that the Red Wings could still make the playoffs knowing that all these teams have bolstered their rosters and all these teams that are probably still going to. Derek. Well, uh, yeah, honestly, I do. Even though these big trades are happening with the ease and you see all these big name players get swapped over, it's still the first time these players are all playing together. Like, you need to have some, like, correlation going on with these players to be able to make it this far. And the Red Wings have been putting that together for seven years now. We've noticed that. And, like, having a good push will actually still help them in the future because we're going to see what they can do and what they need to improve on. And then after that, we're going to see exactly, like, even if they don't get kicked out in the first round, I know it's going to be, you know, we're probably going to go against Boston. We make them to the wild card spot. It's most likely that kind of situation. But at the same time, if we beat Boston, like, what, what do you think is going to happen? Like, we literally have endless options at that point. Like, if you beat Boston, number one team right now in the league, and this possibility to move forward at that point. But we just got to keep the same mentality that we've had going for the last, what, 15 games? I think we're, what, 10 and 5 right now? Like, we can't beat 200%. That's beautiful. We keep that going, we'll end up in the playoffs, no problem. Yeah, I think in the last 10 games, we're 8 and 2, I believe. That's even. Screw 10 and 15, I love 8 and 2. That sounds better. Yeah, okay. So, Leslie. I think I already know what your response is going to be, but I want to hear it from you. You know, do you think that this is going to hinder the Red Wings playoff chances or do you think that they can still make a push? And do you think that they even have a possibility to make an even bigger push if they can beat a team like the Boston Bruins in the first round? Do you think that there is a possibility they could even get in the second round? So I I think with all these trades going down and you see all those big names going to teams in the East, it's just... It's such a thunderdome over here in in the East Conference. It's, it's chaotic. It's be I tough, love it. But yeah, I love. I mean, I love it too. I love the competition. That's that's what makes watching hockey so much fun. Not but that Disneyland piss shit that they got over there in the West Coast, man. Well, those West Coast teams. I mean, they're they're just pissing all over themselves, and it's running down to each team below them. So I don't know what the hell's going on over there. But yeah, I I think if you watching how they played yesterday against Tampa Bay, I mean. If you play like that against every other team you're playing down this stretch, yeah. you bet your fucking ass that's a playoff team right there. That team, I mean, I don't want I don't want to get too far out of bounds here, but that team looked like they could have competed for a cup. They were so good. Every line was going. I mean, you get goalie, it happens. You know, Vasilevsky, he's just like legal cheating. So yeah. it, it happens. It happens once, one now and again. I mean, we've had Huso a brick wall against other teams so we know what that's like on the other end but you know i i said it on the last recording which unfortunately got lost but i'll say it again uh the last eighth seed to go to a cup and win one was the la kings you know they upset their way all the way to the cup and i believe they did it again 2014 so pretty sure they did it twice if they weren't the eighth seed again the second time i I think they were at least the seventh so yes you can say that they 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 were underdogs twice to win the cup so you get in the playoffs and no matter who you're playing against you you throw out the record books it's a brand new season it's a brand new style of hockey we have guys on this team who are experienced in the playoffs who have won cups I, i really feel like with this team the way it's put together they may need to add a little something, but I, I think right now, the way they're playing, they're, they're good enough to compete with anybody. I, I really... I I think we lost Leslie. Leslie froze. Um, 
So Derek. You still see me. That's the important thing. So Derek, I'll ask you this. Well, we already asked you that question. So, okay, Leslie, I don't know what's going on with you, but we're going to move on, and I'm just going to go continue on with the trades that we did miss. Um, hopefully, we'll get you back here shortly, buddy. Um, but to... There, there he is. I was about three minutes here for a third. Leslie, so we, just we just lost you for a little bit. You froze. Um, I don't know what you were finishing up on, but just give us your final thoughts on what, what you thought about that. Um, so do you think that they could still make the push or not? I definitely think they can, and I think even if you play against a team like Boston, which I think it's projecting, or maybe even Carolina, and if it is a really tough series, which you may get swept or you just have tough performances, you at least show those young guys on your team what it takes to compete in the playoffs and win games. Yeah, They can come out of that in the offseason and say, boy, that was a tough fight, but we know what gear we need to find yeah. to push ourselves through the playoffs and when we get more prospects up and those younger guys develop more, they reach their ceilings, I mean, we really could make some noise in the next few years. And I think it's massively important to make it very soon, if it can be this year, just to get your foot in the door. Because last I checked, the way you win the Stanley Cup, you have to make the playoffs first. So yeah. we at least need to start with that. And we'll see what happens when we get there. But... If anything else, it's a great learning experience for those guys like Raymond Sider, Bergren, I mean, you name it. So, I, I would love to see a playoff push. I think at this point in the season, I'm not sitting there banging the table for them to, ha to tank and get Bedard. It's way too late at this point anyways. But I would I would love to see a playoff push. And the way they're playing, I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I do, like I said, the Rasmussen injury, I think that definitely plays a factor into it. And you might... You, and you can. You can call me silly for saying this, but I really do believe that I – this will be my hot take that I think that if you traded Tyler Bertuzzi, I think the player that you replace him with would be Michael Rasmussen. Michael Rasmussen, I kid you not, I the more I watch him, the more similar – type of play he does yeah. as Tyler Bertuzzi. He goes into the corners. He gets into those mm -hmm. battles. He gets in front of the net. He goes into the dirty areas. And he's just so big that he can control that. You know, and he's really hard to get the puck off his stick as well. And he's just an all-round, like, he's finding his game finally. And it really sucks that we lost him this close to the deadline. Um, I think it probably would have hurt even more had we lost him after the deadline. So part of me is kind of, I'm not glad that he got injured, but I'm ha uh, all right that it happened before the deadline. I don't, there's not a good way to say it guys. So don't be uh, mad at me. Never, <laughs> there's never good timing of those kinds of things, but yeah. yeah we'll so, see. so me personally, I mean, you, you know, want to see a play too. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, me yep. personally, if you're not making any trades or anything, you know, do I think that this team could still make the playoffs? Yes, I do. A lot of things have to go right, and a lot of things have to go wrong for other teams. Um, yeah, kind of like how we touched on the two Ottawa games back-to-back. -back. If we win both of those games, that might seal a deal on Ottawa, to be honest with you. I don't know how they could mm -hmm. climb back after those two losses. Um, you know, that'll be both of both the Red Wings and Ottawa's 60th game of the season. So you only got 22 left to go. Obviously, that's plenty more time, but six points is huge. That's that's a three-game difference that you have to catch up now to the Red Wings. Well, actually, I lied. That would be a four-game difference, so that would be eight points. Yeah, it's going to be even more tough for them to get up there if they don't, if Ottawa doesn't try to at least get one or two points out of it. I digress, and I want to go back to originally what we were discussing is all these trades that we missed before the Timo Meyer uh, blew our minds. To continue on, on February 25th, the Colorado Avalanche acquired goaltender Keith Kincaid from Boston Bruins in exchange for forward Shane Bowers. Shout out to my boy Chase. Um, you guys really are making blockbuster trades out here. What can I tell you? He's a... He's a Avalanche fan himself, uh, one of my boys, one of my work colleagues, so big shout-out to him. Keep it up, buddy. I hope you guys don't win another Stanley Cup for another 20 years because I'm a Red Wings fan, and abs suck. February 25th as well, Vancouver Canucks acquired Vitaly Kratsov. This was an interesting one. Vitaly Kratsov from the New York Rangers in exchange for 
forward William Lockwood and the seventh round pick in the 2026 NHL draft again, Derek? I really hate hearing that. It's so weird, but I get it, but I don't like it. It just sounds wrong. Now, I, I don't want, I don't, when I, when I talk about this, I'm not intending to go deep into it, but Vitaly Kratsov, this was a player that at the beginning of the year that they were rumbling saying that you could at least get a third round pick for this guy. And it's crazy to think that they literally got, I don't know too much about William Lockwood. I'm assuming he's an AHL, fringe NHL guy, and then you got a seventh round pick out of it. So you pretty much got next to nothing, so that way you can clear your spot and clear a little bit of cap. February 25th as well, Winnipeg Jets forward Nito Niederreiter. Oh, sorry. Winnipeg Jets acquire forward Nito Niederreiter from the Nashville Predators in exchange for a second-round pick in the 2024 NHL draft. I like that pickup for the Jets. For a second. That's a That's not a so that goes to show you that now the Nashville Predators are in seller mode. Yeah. They are kind of like... It's weird to say it. They're like the Red Wings light where they tried their best to hold a streak going, but they were always in and out, but they were always like in that weird middle, right? Where like some years they make the playoffs, some years they don't. But if they don't, like sometimes it's really bad, but sometimes it's like just right outside. So maybe this oh, is fine. Yeah, related to that with Nashville. Yeah, their GM. Yeah, the GM. So David Poyle stepped down after 26 seasons and – Barry Trotz is the one who replaces him, the first coach in Predators history. So that's that's very that's a pretty crazy piece of news. I mean, we all knew that Barry Trotz wanted to go back into coaching, but I guess now that there's an open GM spot, he figured, oh, let me go do that because he, he was interested in that too. So it's very funny that <laughs> the day after they make that trade, he says, all right, that's the last one for my career. I'm done. Yeah, no, I – I knew that there were rumblings that he was looking at either continuing coaching, but there was the possibility of him wanting to go into being a GM. And yeah, he's been coaching for so long that I think he wants a little something new, a little more stability than there would be for coaching. Because when it comes to coaching, you know, you're, you're the leader of the team and other than the captain, you're the one who takes all the backlash if you don't win, if you don't show the results. And, you know, he won the cup with the Washington Capitals, and, you know, he spent all those years with Nashville. So winning that cup and then going back to his roots, it's the same thing as what Iserman pretty did, pretty much did, right? Like, he built the cup-winning team at Tampa. He technically did get a cup with Tampa. And then he came to the Red Wings. So I... I all the best of luck to Barry Trotz, honestly. I think he will be a fantastic general manager, and I think he will. I don't want to say this, but I think he could probably take them to the promised land. Knowing what he did with Washington and what he has to do, I think he has the knowledge and experience to finally bring that franchise to the cup win that they so much deserve. And they went to the they went to the Stanley Cup final once. Uh, was, yeah, 2017, I think. Who was it against? Quiz time. Pittsburgh? That's Yeah. Hate them, too. That was, I think, That's like, fair that was the second year of their back-to-back when they won against the Sharks. That was, Shh. I guess that was 15? Maybe, maybe it was 16. I don't know. Get it? Stop it. All right, yeah, moving on. We don't want to bring back bad memories. Let's not talk about that. They're gross. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on. I February twenty sixth, Dallas Stars acquire forward Evgeny Dadanov, and I didn't realize this until later today. They acquire Evgeny Dadanov from the Montreal Canadiens in exchange for forward Dennis Garyanov. A lot of teams were saying did Dennis Garyanov were actually going to be a part of a trade that would send off the cap for the team to take on. So that way they had more cap space to use for the player that was coming in. So like they would give us Dennis Garyanov, we would give them Tyler Bertuzzi and they would still give us like a first because we took our cap. So a situation like that, that's what I thought was going to happen. And uh, I can still see this happening even with Evgeny Dadanov, but I know that he's a goal scorer and that's possibly something that the Dallas Stars might actually really want. 
I don't know what their issues are, to be honest with you, with the Dallas Stars. Um, I would assume that it's mainly just a bottom six thing. Um, maybe even defense, but I'm not really too sure on that. But moving on, on February 26th as well, which I don't know why I'm saying the date because it is technically today. The Vegas Golden Knights acquire forward Ivan Barbashev. I didn't even know this trade happened either. From St. Louis Blues in exchange for forward Zach Dean. Oh yeah, I saw that one earlier. That wasn't a too bad of a trade right there. Yeah, that that really helps out the Vegas Golden Knights. I I I mean Dean's down there killing it. What is he in the AHL? No, he's not in the AHL. Uh, no, I think he is. I think he is. is. He? Yeah, I think he's with the Wolves. Yeah, yeah I think he's right too. Yeah, I, think, I don't know if they're still the Wolves. I mean, I think he has like almost fifty points already this season, mm -hmm. and like less than fifty He's a first games. rounder in, I want to say twenty twenty, maybe nineteen. I think it's twenty twenty one. Oh, okay. I think from what I, I mean, I saw this earlier too, so I wasn't too sure about it either. But so Zach Dean plays in the AHL right now. Or hey, no, Derek knows no, he stuff. doesn't. So why is this, why is he knows this, some prospects, he just doesn't know ours. It's it's no no I don't. It said that he was when I before I clicked on his name, but yeah, he plays in the queue right now. He's got forty nine points in thirty eight games, and then he played for the World Junior Championship U twenty team. He put up three points in seven games. I think that's where I know him from. For Canada, that's a, that's a good one for freaking Vegas right there. Mm -hmm. No, Zach Dean went to St. Louis. Oh, yeah, I know. Vegas got yeah. Barbashev. Barbashev wants to sit to Vegas, yeah. And no cap, I was, they need it. no cap was retained in that either, which surprises me because, like I said, the Vegas Golden Knights are a very cap-strapped team, and they always have been. Mm -hmm. um, but that yeah, comes but they, with, because they have so much on LTIR that they're able to uh, kind of fix that up a little bit. So They got a lot of pieces on LTIR right now. They've um, never really been afraid to mortgage their future for win now. I mean, it's kind of been their brand ever since they've been in the league. I mean, it's their, they're, the betting, they're the betting team, so, you know, might as well go with it. Always about the house, I guess, yeah. And then there's another trade that I completely just missed out on, and it was a Colorado trade. They traded, actually, I sent it to my boy Chase. So let me pull that up real quick. They traded... Jack Johnson. Yeah, they got Jack Johnson back for yeah. uh, Andreas England. Yeah, he yep. won a couple with them last year, so I guess they... Really... I was going to say, he literally left for less than a year. Yeah, and they pretty much got him back for almost next to nothing, which is pretty good. So, familiarity, um, that only helps them out. But still, they're still out in the car. Who knows when they're going to get him back? And then Landeskog, who knows when they're going to get him back as well. So, it's looking pretty rough for them, but... Pretty sure they're on a three-game heater, too, so I'm not too worried about, and neither is Chase, about the abs, you know. Um, I told them if they no, got they Bedard, I told Chase if they somehow managed to get Bedard, I don't know how they would get Bedard, but I told them I would instantly become a bandwagon fan, and I'm getting a Miko Rantanen jersey. That's what I told them. I'm a, I'm a oh, Rantanen guy. So I, I'm a big Rantanen guy. I will admit that. As much as I hate the abs, I let... I, I get them in fantasy every year. Hey, if you guys choose not to pick them up, that's your fault, okay? And Derek, stop hey, sending me booty I'll trades. Trade, yeah. <laughs> I got some good trade, 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 trade for you, buddy. Not to get too off topic, but uh, I did move our trade deadline back on the uh, uh, fantasy league so we can make trades until March 6th. So that way, at least we still have a couple days to decide if we do want to keep these players who did get I, traded after. I was wondering earlier why I couldn't make a trade. I'm like, let me make my booty trade for yeah. that and let me have fun with it. It won't let me. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I kind of want to sit on this Timo Meyer trade a little bit more, but I don't because that makes me wonder... When is Chitrin gonna get done? He's been he's been out he's been out for almost the whole entire month. I don't know how much longer you can sit him. Oh, the other person I want to talk about. I'm sorry, guys. Patrick Kane. I don't know how much you guys have been keeping up on that. Supposedly that deal is done, but the pieces aren't done. So the rumor is is that Patrick Kane is now at home, and when I say at home, it's not at his. Fancy little home in Chicago. It's 
in New York somewhere, where he's from, where he was born and raised. The rumor is is that he is only willing to move his trade clause and only willing to accept a trade to the Rangers. Now, what does that tell you? I'll tell you what that tells you. The Blackhawks are fucking screwed. They're literally only going to get a second round pick for this guy. They waited too long, like I said, and they just had no leverage in general. And honestly, that's better than nothing. But still, they, I mean, I don't know what's better. You holding the $10.5 million bag on Kane and Taves or getting a second for Kane and hold the bag on Taves still? You know, like, it's just a lose-lose in my opinion. I, they really mishandled the whole entire situation. But to be honest with you, I'm kind of glad that that's all they're getting as a second. I think it would have been mean, really bad if they got anything more. And to be honest with you guys, I think that that's the Rangers' least bit of concerns is going out and getting Kane. Like, if they get Kane, that only opens up another big hole that they have. Their defense sucks. It's really bad. If you go and look at their last, like, 10 games... It's been god awful, and for people Wait, to say like, getting Zaitsev didn't fix it. Yeah, I mean, like I had this one guy on Twitter. He he, he tweeted to me. And he was like, "Yeah, the Rangers have only scored uh, four goals in their last six games. You don't think adding Patrick Kane would help that? It might help them with scoring, but like they're gonna get scored on more as well because Kane doesn't know how to play defense. Well, that's because he plays on a bad team. If he goes on a cup contending team, that changes everything." Look at the Rangers, my dude. Look at the look at the Rangers roster, my dude. Like that, like we sent the picture in the group chat, right? Like their top six is just freaking insane. Um, I just want to hear from you guys. Do you think this is actually a good idea for the Rangers to get Patrick Kane actually after they just got Vladimir Tarasenko, two lethal scoring forwards? Does that really make sense, Derek? What do you think overall? Like how much you pay him? It's like a situation like we got a freaking Tom Brady going set over there who was he was great forever, but he just wanted to go to Tampa Bay just because he's gonna retire down there. Is it because Kane wants to go home and retire, so he's gonna play another two years over there and be done with hockey? I don't know. I mean, I know Kane isn't a bad player, but we can't push that out. He is on a bad team right now. Like the Chicago Blackhawks have downturn horrifically but at the same yes. time you can't say anything against the fact that Kane still is a good, very good player he's a great player he still is a player yes. he'll depth on the team and some experience as well because he's old as shit now but at the same time like you got a young Rangers that'll help them out give them some like idea of what they need to do for next year probably not gonna do too much this year I don't think for the Rangers might be a playoff contender but not gonna do too much but next year, they'll at least have an idea of what they need to do with him. And then he'll retire and be gone. That'll be it. As long as they get him for a good price. Because I didn't see them post anything about how much he's getting paid. I, I, so, if I, they get him for that, that's the real thing right now. That That's the other thing that you, that I think people are not taking into consideration. And to be honest with you, there, a lot of people aren't really talking about that. Is that they have, they don't even have 500 k left in their cap space to utilize. If... The, Chicago takes even 50% back. His cap hit is over $10.5 million. They have to be giving up a lot. You know, so, like, not only... Like, you're going to have to get a third team to come in here. And I'm telling you right now, the Chicago Blackhawks... I'm I'm putting it out there right now. It's only going to be a second-round pick that they're going to get. Chicago's only going to get a second-round pick. Patrick... It's not just Patrick Kane... But Patrick Kane truly did actually put them in a really tough and bad position to trade him because that's literally the only team he wants to go to. And the Rangers don't really have a need for him. And they're like, okay, well, if you if you really want us to take him that bad, this is what we'll give you. We'll give you a second. Take it or leave it. They don't need him. That's, that's the leverage that the Rangers currently have right now is that they don't need him. Let me read you all. Let me read you guys the line combinations that the Rangers currently have. Okay, here's their top line. Chris Kreider. Goal scorer, Mika Zibanejad, playmaker, Vladimir Tarasenko, goal scorer. Second line, Artemi Panarin, all-round really good player. Vincent Trotrak, all-round really good player. Barclay Goodrow, you can make the case that he probably shouldn't be on there. And we were talking about Leslie, how Jimmy Vesey at one point, he was 
slide it in the top line for whatever reason. I don't know if it just changes on the day to day, but yeah, then you get then you look at the third line. You have Lafreniere, Philip Hedel, and Kappa Kakao. Where do you put Patrick Kane on here? And why do you think adding another goal scoring threat is really going to change the dynamic of your team? We dummied them four to one. The Red Wings dummied them four to one. Granted, they didn't have Igor in, but Igor hasn't been playing well either. So it just blows my mind that like these Rangers fans and the Rangers are actually considering just getting Patrick Kane. I, I, I almost feel like if I was the Chicago GM, I'd just be like, we're just not going to trade you. We're not just going to give you a way to a team to let you help them win just to get a second round pick back. I don't even care. Even if the draft is so deep in 2023, that second round pick is nowhere going to be near as good as Patrick Kane. Not even close. I'd be surprised if he even turns out to a regular 50-point player, to be honest with you guys. That's where I stand. I'm sorry. I went on a rant. It's Le- Patrick Kane. What can you do? Leslie, how do you feel, bud? He's a scoring winger, Zach. Anyone but take him. Literally anyone but take him. I mean, we're talking about a guy, he he has seven goals in the past four games. He's finally starting to turn it on after really not looking that great this year. This is a trade where you just, if you're in New York, you just make this trade, and when you get Kane, you you forgot where to put him later because it doesn't even matter because you made a trade. You're not going to give up that much for Patrick fucking Kane, who's won three cups and has been a legend. On the Chicago Blackhawks. Maybe the best Blackhawk of all time. It's, I mean, this is like, outside of Meyer, this is going to be the biggest fish to land. I don't trade deadline. So for me, it's not the worry about where are you going to put them because you easily just put them in the top six. I mean, you can just yeah, by putting them on the third line. That's cool. But like for me, it's the fact. Down. Whatever. But for me, the issue is, is that Patrick Kane isn't giving the GM anything to work with. The Rangers don't have the cap space. So it just feels like that Chicago has to take whatever they fucking can. And it's not yeah, going I mean, to be a it's not going to be a first to be honest with you. They're in a rock and a hard place. It's just I, they have really no one to blame besides Patrick Kane and just flip flopping on his decision every day. I mean, yeah. this is like Giroux last year. He only wanted to go to the Panthers. That means the price that he could have gotten became way lower. You know, so I, I also feel like if you're Chicago and the way you're going to plan out your next eight to ten years of just sucking as much as you can and getting future assets. You can't get much for Patrick Kane, but you, you gotta get what you can get because you're looking at a situation where he could just walk away from playing hockey, or just walk away from the team as a free agent next year. I mean, you just really gotta get whatever you can for him. And if it's only a second and maybe a prospect, I don't even really know what prospects New York has left at this point. You kind of have to make that deal because yeah. you can't just leave your best player holding the like. You can't leave your team holding the bag on your best player in the summer. If you're the GM and you're doing that, you've failed at your job, and your seat should be risen by a few degrees. So you unfortunately just have to get whatever you can for them. It's just the way it is. It's the situation that Kane has made for them, and he he pooped in their bed and they got a lineup. Yeah, that's, that's all right. Where you going to put it? Yep. So, a soggy bed. So, I think for me, I don't have any more things to go over. Um, does anyone have any th- final thoughts before I kind of close us out for tonight's episode? Yeah, let's beat Ottawa twice. Let's do it, boys. That was uh, that was going to be my final closing statement. So, I just want to ask you guys one more question. You know. What do you, other than dubs, what do you guys expect out of these back-to-back games? Do you guys hope that it's a high-scoring game? Do you guys expect it to be both high-scoring games? Do you think one game's going to be a blowout on either side and then it's going to be closer in the second game? Or what are you guys kind of expecting or what are you guys hoping to see? Me, I I think I... Let me start. I Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Derek. So for me to start, one thing I do want to see, I want to see Lucas Raymond back. That's first thing. The second thing I want is I want to see Verona play back-to-back games. 
I, I do actually want to see him put back into the lineup, and I want to see him play games back-to-back. He has not been able to do that so far this season, and I think that that will, for, for showcase purposes, obviously, you know. And the more I go into the trade deadline, the more I keep telling myself, it's not the worst if you trade Verona or Bertuzzi. And I think I would rather trade Bertuzzi than Verona because we do have Verona longer based on his contract. Um, because negotiations supposedly aren't going well with Bertuzzi. Not saying that they can't progress in the summertime, but yeah, I think you're going to try and get as... Same thing with Kane. You just got to get what you can. Because to be honest with you, I know that Bertuzzi has done a lot for this team, and I do think that he plays an important role here. But I think he, I think he moves on, personally, if we don't sign him. So, um, Derek, you're next. Don't want to say thanks. Go ahead. Back to me. But yeah, I mean, my main thing is I want to see Huso get a goddamn shutout. He's been doing so well with all these games so far. He deserves at least one, especially against Ottawa, a team that we should easily beat every time. Mm-hmm. I'm going for like a three to one, maybe the first game, but the second game, easy two zero three zero. Let's go with that. Like, I would love to see Verona play though. I'm going to get on the bandwagon with you on that one. Back to back games, yeah. keep him going. It's like he has some skill. I've been, he, he's noticeable. That's the good thing. He's like out there. He's not doing anything massive. Not throwing points up. But he's making plays. He's getting passes away. He's starting stuff going. Like, let's see him like get like actual game time. You know, get up to the fifteen minutes, sixteen minutes out there. He'll start putting some points up, making some better plays. Get him on the third. What is he on the third, fourth line right now? I have no idea. Verona. Someone throw that one in. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was third and fourth line duties, but I, I want to throw that in there as well, Derek, that I would like to see him get a little more playing time. Maybe put him on the power play, the second unit. That would be nice. Although, I, I do believe that he did. I think he did on Thursday. A little bit. I could be wrong, but that's also something I would like to see, especially if you are going to showcase him for trade purposes. Uh, but speaking of goalie, Derek... Linus Olmark got a goalie goal last night, so I would love to see Huso get one this season. I think that would be nice. Freaking goalie goal in 30 wins at the same time. Jesus Christ. No yeah. wonder Boston's killing it right now. Leslie, I don't want to hear your propaganda on those goalie hugs being cringe, bro. Those are fantastic. <laughs> we love those goalie goal or, uh, hugs. That was a goal like that. I guess it's only me. I mean, shit, every time I see it, it's just like... What the fuck are you guys doing? Jesus Christ. Spreading the love, man. Hey, spread the love. You're not in the fucking Pee Wee Quebec League. What the fuck? Oh my god. Yeah, have fun in the NHL, you boring sack of crap. Come on. I guess I guess I'm just used to watching Formula One where all the drivers hate each other, so (laughs) I'd rather see that. (laughs) I'd rather see that. Uh, Out of these Ottawa games, I I really want to see the boys, you know, have some more performances like they did against Tampa because these two games, we're sitting here talking about, like, oh, these should be easy wins. These these are literally the definition of trap games. Yeah. They're, mu- they're kind of must-win games, and if the guys go out there and they're kind of sitting back on their heels, they could easily find themselves on the wrong end of this. Um, for, for both games specifically, I'd love to see Cider on Stutzla shutting him down the whole game, mm-hmm. and try and continue Brady Kachuk, too. I think if you kind of shut those two players down, that's a good formula for success in those two games. Yep. And I just I just want to see more positive momentum riding all the way to the deadline. And once you get past that, depending on what they do, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, um, one yeah. added thing that I would like to throw out there, too, is uh, Jake Womengel. He's looked fantastic. Uh, yes. uh, the he more I keep seeing this, the more and more games that he plays, the more I'm just like, okay, just just here's a four by four. I don't even care anymore. Like I'll worry about my defense <laughs> yep. later, like with the prospects yep. and everything. So, what's that's all I have for tonight's um, final thoughts. Go Red Wings, Dubs. Yes, sir. Dubs. Dubs. Go with it. All right, everyone. We'll come back with- what Derek said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, we thank you for joining us on another episode of Hockey Town University. Once again, we will be back on Wednesday nights recording 
Uh, the episode will air on Thursday. Tonight's episode will air on Monday when you guys are listening. Um, yeah, we're hoping for some dubs. And as always, everyone, we thank you again for joining us. And once again, let's go Red Wings. Dubs only. Till next time. Adios. Only thing we preached.